Hey, g'day, it's Prezzo here, back in the shop, and I'm gonna be doing some brass casting today. Now, how all this got started was, some time ago I was doing some work on the mill, and I need to be able to set up a piece of work, and I was dialing it in, and it's necessary to tap it backwards and forwards, and keep checking with your dial indicator, until you've got that centered, or true, or vertical, or square, or whatever it is you wanna do. And typically, what you tend to do is knock it backwards and forwards with a piece of copper bar like this or a, a chunk of aluminium, something that's softer than the work that you're actually trying to set up. Now you wouldn't normally use a little ball pane hammer like this one because the face of the hammer is likely to be harder than the material that you want to cut in the mill or on the lathe. And although this chunk of copper works, I sort of badly wanted to have a tool maker's hammer or a tool setting hammer. I wish I had a proper tool maker's hammer and I decided I had some scrap brass that was given to me and I thought I could cast that into something that looks a bit like this but had a soft brass head and this is what it looks like. So here it is, uh, this has been personalised. Um, if I turn this over you can see I've, I've laser etched my name into the handle and I've got a monogram on the side of the head and I made five of these, um, one for me and then there were four for other people that I know. And the video you're about to see today is about learning how to cast these brass hammer heads. Now, I made mistakes and I'm going to try and point those mistakes out as we go along. I did have some help from a, a very knowledgeable mentor, and that's uh, Old Foundryman. And he was giving me advice as I went along, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I would show him photos of what I've done. And he would say, well, you know what, you got that wrong, and you did that wrong, and you should have done this. Uh, which is great um, in terms of learning how to do it properly but as you see as I do it for the first time um, I realise that there are things I could have done better but I'll, I'll try and fix that up as we go along. Okay here's one that I've already made but it's in the unmachined state so that's as it came out of the sand mould and I'm going to do this in a three part um, video series so the first part is going to be about doing the casting for the hammer head. The second part is going to be, I'll turn that around, you can see it better. The second part is about laser etching these hammer handles. And the third part is about fitting the brass hammer head and some auxiliary work to make it look pretty. So that's where we're heading. Um, I invite you to join along. Don't laugh too hard when I make my blunders. Um, we've all been there, we've all done it. It's just that I show it on video. So let's get started. So with our 3D printed pattern for the hammer head, we've got a core print which uh, protrudes from either side of what will eventually be the brass hammer head. Now the shape of the core print is based on the shape of the handle for the hammer. And what we need to do is to make a core which will replace the void left behind by the core print. Now the core is going to be made from a mixture of sand and epoxy resin. And what I've been using lately for making the cores are these 3D printed core boxes. Now traditionally these would be made of wood and for a you know a core that you're going to make you know 100, 200, 300 of that's way more durable but for what I do is I need to make four cores. These are quick, simple, easy to control the dimensions and uh, I've built in a flexure Flexure, uh, what's that? <laughs> it's a split, that's what it is. So there's a split that goes almost all the way through the core box. There's a relief hole at the end there. I don't know if you can see that. And that allows you to flex that just enough to get the core out very easily. So what we need to do is to put some mold release on this. I've already sanded this just to get rid of the layer lines. And we're gonna use a, a wax, uh, you know, a liberal coating of wax burnish that quite well and that seems to release the, the epoxy and the sand mixture very easily. So let's go ahead get these wax up and mix our sand and epoxy and they'll have to set overnight. I've just been using this stuff here it's a Canuba wax and beeswax mix um, it's what I've got works well floor wax would do pretty much any sort of wax I think. If you get a bit in that slit where the flexure is doesn't really hurt. I'll we'll actually keep the sand and epoxy mix out of there really. 
guess the important thing is just to be thorough. Make sure you get it right to the very ends. Uh, just because I'm a bit dumb, <laughs> I forgot to put the flexure in this one here. Also forgot to mirror this part when I 3D printed it. So the dowel pin holes don't oppose as they should. So I'm going to have to hold this together with tape. Uh, so oh, it's an interesting experiment. Well, let's just see if it, uh, we can get the core out of that without having the split line. The epoxy that I'm using this time is a West System uh, 105 epoxy resin and a 206 slow hardener. So that's the, the hardener there. I did have a clear casting resin that I've been using on some other cores, but uh, one part of it sort of went off. I uh, just went to get it out of the cupboard and it sort of uh, turned into a sort of an opaque gel in the container. So I had to toss that out. I only used about 10% of it. Apparently it doesn't keep. But this uh, West System epoxy is great. Um, it seems to last indefinitely. So I've given that a good mix and we're going to add that to the sand. So the sand is just ordinary white beach sand. Um, I use this for making the green sand for my foundry. And I used to get really worried about ratios and percentages of resin and that sort of thing, but I found in practice you just sort of mix it up until it sort of goes like green sand. So that much should be enough. I mean you could, if you really wanted to, you could sort of pour it into the the cavity of the core box and calculate it out for the amount that you need and do all the percentages but uh, <laughs> I like to live dangerously so I'm just gonna wing it what do you reckon is that three percent That's starting to look about right. Um, it should sort of pack together like green sand does. Might add a bit more resin, I think. There you go, that's 5%. The appearance changes too. It starts to look sort of wet. It doesn't sort of run as freely as it did before. I mean, if you were doing this a lot, you'd probably want to get your ratio spot on so you didn't waste resin and you know the results are more predictable for what I'm doing which is nearly always just one-offs um, it probably not worth it now initially it, it looks like it's not going to mix you know it clumps up and you get pockets of resin and dry sand but it's surprising how quickly that comes together okay that's pretty good. Just holding these together with rubber bands just to make sure they don't separate. And I'm just going to jam that down in there. So the, the last thing I want to do is to run a vent wire down through the centre of the core. This is just to allow any hot gases to escape. And that's it. So we're just going to let that set overnight and we'll see how they go. Alright, this is the last one and you can put wires down through these cores as well just to reinforce them. If you've got a very thin core and it's liable to break, you can leave the wire in there. For these I think uh, there's enough thickness in those to be self-supporting so we should be fine. Alright, so there's our four cores. And I had just enough sand and resin mix, a bit left over. We'll check in tomorrow and see how they came out.
This has been left overnight. I always keep the leftover sand and resin and just uh, make sure that's fully hardened and that's strong enough for what we need. So let's see if we can get these babies out. It's always a good sign. So that half looks good. In theory, you should be able to just bend that core box and it will release the core. There it goes. All right, one core. And that little flash line there, that was where the flex shoe was. That just sort of scrapes away. So that's it. So we'll get the other three of those out and then we'll start casting. So there's our four cores now, uh, we'll get them cleaned up, just remove the flashing from them and we'll get the boxes around up for the hammerheads and we're in business. Okay, well, these are my split patterns for the hammerheads and I want to make four hammers and I want each one to have a personalized monogram on this elliptical face here. Now, with the patterns, you've got to sort of imagine that these core prints aren't there. So that would be the shape of the hammerhead just like a regular ball paint hammer. And the handle, of course, is going to slide up into the void left behind when we put the core into the sand mold. Now, because I want four hammers, each one's different or unique, I didn't really want to print four individual patterns. And that would have meant eight parts or for the two halves, print it on the 3D printer, and then you've got to do all the post-processing, sand it, paint it, and so on. So I came up with this idea of uh, having the monogram disc as a removable part. So with this one here, for example, I can just turn that over, put a pin through from the back and pop that little monogram out of there and then swap that out for one of the others. So uh, you may find this useful if you've got to make um, a series of parts which have mostly common features, but you want to be able to swap out uh, say one feature for another. So this technique seems to work fairly well. I've already tried it out uh, by ramming one of these halves up. The little monogram there has a draft angle of about seven degrees, which is more than you'd usually use. But it means that we can get the detail and the definition in that lettering. So let's go ahead now, let's uh, ram up two flasks. We're gonna do two hammer heads per flask and like I say, each one is going to be personalized as gifts and one for me. So with our 3D printed patterns, you just got to be sure that these monogram discs are pressed in firmly. So there are uh, four sets of these and they get swapped out when you've done each flask. And you just got to be sure that they're aligned correctly on both sides of the pattern. And I went to the trouble of marking these with some permanent marker on the inside there. Now don't ask me why I know you need to do that, <laughs> but you do. So we're going to arrange these in the flask so the hammer faces are toward each other and about there and we're going to put a big riser in between and a sprue here. Pouring basin over here and Bob's your uncle, so I'm going to go ahead and get this one rammed up. Uh, the other one's pretty much the same, and then we'll see how we get on.
This is just uh, my own home brew green sand, nothing special. Petra Bond would be better. <laughs> you tell me where I can buy it. Here in Australia, it's not so easy to get. Okay, so checking our color coding then so the black spot goes with the black spot. Alright, so I'm thinking we're going to put our feeder riser there. sprue over here. Okay let me stop the video right there. This is the sprue cutter that I use to make the entry point for the molten metal into the mold. It's a piece of steel tubing around about 16 millimeters diameter and it's sharpened to an edge and I've used this on molds in the past and it works. Uh, it sort of does what I need it to do. However my mentor old foundryman said that I should be using this. This is a tapered sprue cutter it's around about 9 millimeters at the narrow end, although I've been told that 8 millimeters is better, and it tapers up to around about 16 to 18 millimeters at the top. Now it depends on how thick your cope is as to how much of a, an opening you'll get at the top of the mold, but the taper is relatively constant, or the taper is constant. Now there are many reasons why you should use a tapered sprue, but it's mostly to do with keeping a constant velocity of molten metal going into the mold. It also means that you get a controlled flow of metal with no entrapped air and that's important if you're looking to avoid porosity. So as you watch the rest of the video I want you to mentally substitute this tapered sprue for the cylindrical one, the bad cylindrical one that I used. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, let me pause here for another admission of guilt. What you're about to see me do here is to get a spoon and turn this cylindrical uh, depression in the top of the coat into a sort of a, like a bowl shape. Now it seemed logical to me that if you want to pour molten metal into a pouring basin you want to sort of have this nice uniformly bowl shaped opening. However, what you are meant to do is to take this same piece of pipe that I used which is 35 millimeters diameter. It's sharpened to an edge on the inside, so it's got quite a sharp edge here. I've marked a line here at 35 millimeters from that sharp edge. And the notion is that you push that down into the cope to that full depth of 35 millimeters, then withdraw it from the cope and it will pull out a plug of sand, which is 35 diameter, 35 deep. And then just leave it at that. That gets connected to the hole where the sprue, or what should be the tapered sprue, enters the mold. And what this does is it uh, allows the molten metal as you pour it in, you've got a quite a large container to pour it into, it will overflow into the sprue. And the roughly cylindrical shape will stop the metal from deflecting back up and out of that bowl shape. Uh, if you think about it for a moment, if you get a, like a small bowl, put it in the sink and direct a jet of water into it. 
it just simply hits the bottom, deflects and flows back up over the sides. So we don't want that, we want the metal to stay in that depression and just gently overflow into the sprue. So once again, if you see me doing this, you've got to mentally substitute this nice cylindrical shaped flat bottomed hole for what you see me do in a minute. Okay, so there's our pouring basin, here's our screw, uh, sorry, here's our riser. We'll get this apart, see how it looks. Alright, tidy that up in a minute. Now, the tricky part is to get these out without destroying the delicate uh, detail around that monogram. The other thing I noticed with these 3D printed patterns is they've always got a slight round on this edge here and that sand gets trapped on top. When you go to extract the pattern it tends to break away the sand right on the edge. Now that in itself doesn't damage the casting, it just means that you get a flash line around the, the joint. But probably better if you don't have that. Less clean up anyway. All right. See what I mean about it breaking away a bit there? But the detail on the bottom there around the monogram is very, very good. It's nice and crisp. Same with that one. <laughs> That's a bit of a relief. All right, so I'm gonna tidy this up now. This is where the core is gonna go. I'm just gonna make a bit of a path for any gases to escape from the end of the core. Remember we vented the cores. Okay, we get this all cleaned out. Okay, this is an important thing. Don't forget to put the cores in. Ah, damn it, just lost part of the end there. Well, that's my hammer, so <laughs> I'll have to live with that. I can probably cut that out with a Dremel later. All right, that one's good. Yeah, so I don't know if you can see, but I've lost a bit off the, the leg at the end there. It's a bit of a nuisance, but it's not worth doing it all again. And the last thing I'm going to do is just to run a vent wire through to the top of the cope. Okay, so I get all this cleaned out, put it together, and then the other flask it is exactly the same. See how that 
section of the M is missing there. Other one's good. Okay, I believe that's called a trial close, just to make sure we didn't dislodge anything. It all looks good. That can go back together again. Uh, we'll get the other one done. I'm going to light the furnace now and get everything hot. We'll go from there. That uh, shrinkage appears in the riser almost immediately, like minutes after you've poured it, or even less. So it goes down quite a long way. Uh, it's surprising how much shrinkage you get in brass compared to aluminium. Anyway, they filled up well. I'm sort of hoping that they're a success because I don't want to do it again. <laughs> Come back in 20 minutes, see how they went. Alright, see how we went. Um, if you noticed, uh, I showed a shot there of the furnace with a lot of yellow fumes coming out of it. That was the zinc burning out of the brass. I did actually add some more zinc just before I poured this. Let's see what it looks like. Yes! That looks promising. And there's the uh, the remains of the core. So you can see the part that came into contact with the melted brass is completely charred. But that's what it's meant to do. And we got two nice clear holes through our hammerheads. Okay, here's the other one. <coughs> I think you can see on this one here with the letter M, there's uh, a little loss of detail there on that one. Other side's good. J worked out well. Got the voids through where the cores were, so that's all good. Let me get one of these cleaned up and I'll give you a closer look. One thing I realise you've got to do is to retrieve the half burnt cores from the, the sand when you mull it. Uh, this stuff doesn't crush, it's, it's quite firm, so you really got to get it out. Got to get these out too. <laughs> Best thing I ever made for the shop, that thing. I just cut that one off the, the runner and gave it a quick um, file just to remove the, the flashing from the joint line there. Uh, linished the face and the outside of the head, done the side of the, the what do you call that, the cheek, side of the head. It's looking good. 
needs a lot more work yet uh, before that's ready. But I think the uh, monograms came out good and fit on the handle okay. I'm going to have to do some work shaping the end of that handle and getting the wedge in that. But uh, yeah, it's looking good. Here's the other one that came out of the, uh, the first mould that I did and uh, you know, happy with these. The uh, lettering came out quite well. Uh, but now it's confession time. This is the one that I did for Rick and that, that was the whole purpose of this video series was making one of these hammers for my friend Rick. And guess what? I screwed it up. <laughs> if I turn this over, have a look at the letter R on this one. Let me turn it over. And guess what? It's upside down. So Mark the Idiot did not pay attention while he was doing this, so I'm going to have to do another one. I can't give it to him like this. So I'll do two more, I'll melt this one as well, and I'll make one for another friend of mine. So that's what you get when you're making videos for YouTube. You, you've got to divide your attention between two tasks, and of course I'm a man, and men can't do that, so that's what happens. So, bugger, do it again, idiot. Okay, well here we are. That's uh, the pattern to the finished brass casting. And as you can see with this one that I've done for Rick, I did eventually get it right. So there's the monogram on this side. If I turn that over, you can see the monogram on the other side aligns correctly. So at least got that right. We've got our cord hole through the hammer head. And uh, dimensionally, this has worked out okay. In the next video, we'll see the laser etching process for the handles, and in the third one, we're going to do the machining processes for the, the hammer head itself, and we're going to do some powder coating. We're going to pick out this little monogram in a, a powder coated finish. So that's it. Now, did I make mistakes? Yes, absolutely, and I acknowledge that. <laughs> I did it for your entertainment, and uh, I've tried to correct the record as we go. So uh, don't do as I do, do as I say, and you'll be fine. Okay? I'll catch you on the next video. See ya.